Hi everyone, today I'm turning Japanese. I'm very grateful to a dear friend in Japan who helped me to source this Japanese Kana hand plane. And uh, I've never used a Japanese plane before in my life, and never, certainly never prepared one, so this is going to be really interesting. I know nothing about this, it's all going to have to be based on uh, my knowledge of Western planes and the few bits of information that I've gleaned reading the internet this morning. But the interesting thing is, um, the articles I've read all sort of contradict each other slightly, so <laughs> I really don't know which is going to be the best way. So I'm really going to be basing it on, on what, I, what I think, what I feel is the right thing to do with it. And hopefully some of you out there will know uh, where I can improve on that and will let me know. Now I've taken the blade and the chip breaker out of this plane and now I need to turn my attention to the sole. I've got a straight edge here and I'm going to be testing for straight and flat and quite clearly here there's a bump in the middle of the sole. The other thing I'm going to be testing for is any wind that there might be in the piece of wood. So I've got my winding sticks. So, let's get started. I'm going to check for wind first, so I'll place my winding stick at one end and at the other end, and then sight across the two of them. And I can see that this corner here and the opposite corner over here are slightly high compared to the others. So this corner is slightly high, and this corner is slightly high. Now if I take my straight edge, rest it on those two corners, I can see here that it's touching those two corners, and there's probably a slight gap in the middle. It won't rotate on the middle of the plane. Whereas if, if I take the other diagonal, it wants to rotate just this front side of the mouth. The important points on the plane are the front of the sole, either side of the mouth, and the rear of the sole. I've read different things. Some say that the rear of the sole should actually be, uh, with the plane upside down, it should be lower than the rest of the sole. Some say it should be exactly the same as the sole. Well, I'm going to start with getting it exactly the same as the rest of the sole, and then if it's not working properly, I can remove a bit more and see how we go. What am I going to use on here? Well, I could use one of my Western planes, but the amount of material I need to remove, I'm judging as being quite small, and so I'm going to be using a card scraper. That's getting very close now. The other thing I want to do is, because I'm just taking away from these corners, I could end up with a slightly convex shape on the sole. So I need to make sure I keep that straight. And that's perfect, we've taken all the wind out. Still worry whether we've got a slight bump just in front of the mouth. That diagonal looks all right. Very slightly, slightly high there. Flat. And that's flat. 
One of the other things I read uh, was that with these four points being important, these areas in between should be lowered slightly. And I can do that again with just a few strokes of the card scraper. The pressure right the way across, so we take material off the whole way across the plane, leaving the very end. And I can check that by holding it up to a light source. And that looks good. So I've got the sole nicely prepared. And some of you are going to say, well, what happens when you put the iron in? Maybe that will deflect the sole slightly. And it might, but it should only be localised and we can tackle that a little bit later. But it's important now that we do actually get the iron ready to put in. Now here's the iron and the chip breaker. And they both come with a little bit of lacquer or something on them to prevent rusting. So the first job is to clean those off. Acetone would normally do. This is a combination thinners and it works very well. Gets all that rubbish off. And then we can go on to actually preparing it on some stones. I was going to reach for my water stones at this point but I've got a new sharpening system here that Axminster have asked me to review so as part of uh, learning how it works and how good it is I should be using it here. It's basically a diamond plate and a strop. You can use water stones or ceramic stones it doesn't matter your normal sharpening method will do. So the first thing I'm going to tackle is the, the blade itself and the back of the blade. back of these blades are ground out a little bit, they're hollowed. So the only area we need to make sure is flat is this little U shape on the edge. So if I put that on the stone, it should sit flat, and it does. But it has got some grinding marks in it. So what we're going to try and do is remove those by working on, we've got a thousand grit diamond stone here and then we'll move on to the strop after that. Just notice how most of the motion is going across the stone like this so that the scratch pattern we develop will be along the length of the blade. Now because I don't have much area that is flat on here, I'm just working slightly on the diagonal. And I can see that that's touching virtually the whole area, the sharp area. I just want to work a bit more to get rid of the original grinding marks. I'm quite happy with that. I think we can move over to the strop now and uh, polish out those very fine lines. That looks lovely. So I'll flip it back over again, get the diamond stone out and just work on the bevel. You have to work out for yourself the, the best way of sharpening the bevel. You may be able to adapt a, a honing guide or else do it as I'm doing freehand. I'm looking to replace all the original grinding marks right across the front edge of the blade. And that's it. We've ground right the way to the edge, right along the, the edge of the blade. Replaced all the original striations from the grinding with our new lines. Now to strop the edge I'm going to pull the blade towards me, holding it up very fractionally higher than the bevel angle. So I'm working just on the tip. Now 
turn it over, pull again, take off any slight burr there might be, and flip it and just repeat this process, reducing the number of strops you take on each go. So turning our attention back to the body of the plane, we can now insert our iron and just with thumb pressure push that down into the plane and check underneath and see how close we're getting to the mouth and uh, you can see we're still quite a ways away now I could probably pound that with a hammer to get it to come down right to the front of the mouth but that's not what we want uh, we want to be able to push it almost to the edge with good thumb pressure so that tells me that either the bed is too high or the cheeks in here need relieving a little bit the blade is held in by its wedged shape see it's wedged along its length it's also wedged in its width as well so as we drop the blade in it tightens up both against the sides and also between the bed and the abutment in the body of the plane so the next thing to do is to make sure that it beds properly so I'm just wiping some camellia oil on the back of the blade pop that in some pressure and if you look in there you can see it's transferred to well, actually quite a bit of the bed so it's actually quite nicely prepared but if I just now take um, a scraper I prepared this small scraper with a nice square end on it so it's not too aggressive but it will shave nicely we can just work the areas that are high uh, I have this Japanese small dresser here which is a bit like um, some nail files of different grits that's very useful again for taking small individual spots so we work away till all those oil patches have gone re-oil the blade pop it in again and check for contact keep working until we've got contact over the whole of the bed area now I've done a bit more work on the bed and I'm happy with how well that seats now but the blade still isn't coming right through and as I feed it in it appears to me that there's quite a bit of slack against the abutment which tightens up a little bit but there's an awful lot more tightness in the width so I think I need to just take a chisel and just deepen these mortises at the side very slightly and we just want to do it so the blade gets a little bit closer to the mouth <coughs> probably about half a mil away I'm just working the surface at the sides here just to reduce it slightly so that the blade will penetrate a little bit deeper now we just take a, a little bit off each side to begin with and then recheck So I've spent probably 15 minutes just perfecting that and you can see now that the edge of the blade is almost through the mouth. It's not all the way through yet and I've pushed it in as hard as I can with my thumb pressure and I think now with a couple of taps of the hammer we better bring that through so it takes a shaving. Now I did read uh, that there can be some different things you need to do around the mouth here to allow the blade to come through 
I haven't had any problems with this one. I guess it depends on how the die is cut in the first place. So the next thing I'm going to do is turn my attention to the chip breaker. You don't need to use a chip breaker on these planes, but uh, as with the Western chip breakers, they do help with difficult woods uh, to avoid tear out. Now the chip breaker should just slide in there underneath the little peg, but this is far too tight, so I'm going to have to relieve a bit of pressure either on the sides of the plane or just take a little bit off each side of the chip breaker itself. A couple of minutes on a coarse diamond stone, that now fits in there. I've allowed a little bit of slack, which means we'll be able to get it tight up against the edge of the blade and get it nice and even gap across there. You will notice that at the moment it's way too far up in the plane. Uh, it's already wetting tight, but it's uh, a long way away from the edge of the blade. And also, whether you can see down there, but there's light coming through between the chip breaker and the blade. So we need to prepare the back of the chip breaker so it's a perfect match to the blade. And since we've flattened the back of the blade, that means we need to get the chip breaker nice and flat. To prepare the chip breaker, we need to make sure that A, it's in full contact along the front where it touches the blade, and also that it, it's got point contacts on these back two corners. If I hold the front down against the blade, you can hear it rocking. So there's obviously some work to do there. So now you can see that I've got scratch pattern across the whole of the front edge there, so that should be straight and should be a good match to the iron. But we're still probably going to have the same problem further back. Yep, still one of these back edges is lower than the other. Now seeing as how it was too tight in the plane, I'm going to relieve the one corner edge which is currently showing as high. So if I relieve that with a file, A it should ho hopefully bring this back into balance so it doesn't rock and B it should let it slide further into the plane. So I'll be filing away this corner a little bit. Okay so now I've managed to get a perfect fit on the back with no rocking but it's still too tight in the plane, the, uh, the chip breaker won't go down far enough so I'm going to remove some equal amount of material from both of these corners uh, so that it's not as wedged and so it'll go in further. So after a little bit of work on these bent tabs at the end there, just filing down, I've made it now the right shape wedge so that I can put the blade in down to just about the sole and then the wedge will go in. You can see it's a fair way off the end of the plane like that, but with enough pressure I can push it up nice and close to the edge of the blade. So now the only thing I want to do to the chip breaker is to polish this front bevel and to make sure it's nice and sharp on the front so that any shavings coming off the blade will skip off and come off over the top of the chip breaker and not clog it up. 